Cool. Okay, welcome back, everyone, for this um, uh, afternoon um, session. We've got two talks in, in this slot, and the first talk will be by Jeremy um, Thurgood. How do you pronounce your surname? Thurgood. Um, on um, testing with hypothesis. Um, Jeremy was one of the original people behind um, EC2 at Amazon and now works for Prekelt, making the world a better place. So let's yeah, take it away, Jeremy. So, um, testing. Who here likes writing tests? That's more than I expected. Um, who here likes working on software that isn't tested? Okay, so one person. Um, I won't hire you. Uh, <clears throat> so, this is a talk about property-based testing. Um, what is it? Why do we care? How will it make your software better? Well, let's start with an example of a thing that we want to test. This is a very simple data structure. Did my audio go away? No? Something? I don't know. Um, it's a naive priority queue. It says so right in the class name. It's an implementation that fits on a slide. Don't ever use it in production. It is very slow because it sorts its entire set of um, objects every time. <coughs> but it's got a simple but non-trivial interface which is, um, makes it a reasonable example to test. And maybe you do want to implement a much better version which is higher performance and doesn't sort itself every time. So, how we usually write tests. You've got your implementation. You write a bunch of tests. Each test creates a queue, puts some stuff in it, takes some stuff out of it, makes sure that what you get out is the right kind of thing. And there are lots of tests. And they're not nearly enough because I got bored and did something more interesting, like fighting CSS to make my presentation stuff work. Um, Oh, a warning, there's going to be a lot of code in these slides. There will be a test afterwards. You're expected to remember all of it. Um, pretty much everything I'm talking about, uh, all the stuff I'm talking about and whatever is going to, uh, all the syntax and stuff is in the hypothesis documentation. So don't worry too much about the, the details of the um, slides. It's just kind of example stuff for me to talk around. So, yeah. These are example-based tests because you have some example input and some example output and you are making assertions that your code gives you the right output for the input you give it. They are tedious to write. Um, I get very bored writing those tests and then I write tests badly because I forget what test I'm writing and I end up writing tests for the wrong software or something. Lots of repetition. You're writing the same test over and over again, just with different input and output. And those differences are important because you're testing on each side of a boundary condition or something like that. You need all of those different examples, but structurally they're very similar. Um, painful to maintain. A lot of those tests dig around in the internal details of your code because you want your test to test one thing, not 17 things. So. If you're testing putting something into your queue, you need to look inside the queue to see if it's there. If you're testing taking something out, you want to put it in the queue manually and then check that you get it out. Otherwise, you're testing two things in the same test. And when I was coming up with that example, I changed the order of how things are stored. And then I had to go back and fix all my tests, which were broken, because all my examples had the wrong order of the internal data in the assertions. And all of this is because the focus is on very low-level details. You're saying, I have this stuff, I give it to my code, I get this other stuff back, or it changes the world in some way, and I make sure that the state of the world after running my code is what I expect it to be. Um, so lots of trees, but you can't really see the forest. But still, better than no test at all. At least your code is running, and you can pick up syntax errors, and find bugs for things that you're testing for. So, given that example-based tests aren't the best thing in the world, how do we want to write tests? 
in a world made of unicorns and kittens and rainbows where everything is perfect, we can just do that. From magic, import assert correct. Give your code to assert correct and it tells you what your bugs are and how to fix them. But how does assert correct know what the correct behavior is? Um, obviously because you've got unicorns that can read your mind, but half the time I'm writing code, I don't know what the correct behavior should be. I don't know until I've run it in production and discovered that um, when our telco claims to be giving us UCS2, actually they're giving us half the messages in Latin 1 and the other half is in UTF-8. Um, so a big part of uh, testing is determining what is correct and then encoding that in some way so that you can make assertions about it. So we've got our example code. It's a priority queue. Let's define some correctness for it. Um, <clears throat> priority queue conveniently has uh, two words in its name. There is priority and then queue. So priority means that whatever we get out of it is in priority order. For our implementation, the ordering is smallest first. Maybe it's timestamps. You want to um, process the thing that's due soonest first. So we can write some code to do that. We, assuming we've got a priority queue, which is the first um, parameter there, and a list of items, um, we put all the items into the queue, and then we, well, we check that we do actually have the right number of items in the queue. And then we take items out one at a time, and we assert that um, the item we've just taken out is not smaller than the last one. And if you do that for every item in the queue, you're guaranteed that you will never have your queue give you a small item after a big one um, unless you've got new things being inserted while you're removing. This property doesn't account for that. I'll talk about that stuff later. Um, so there are lots of ways that uh, you can implement something that has this priority ordering property. You could write a queue which just never returns anything. That meets this property. Um, you could write a queue which just gives you none all the time. That meets this property as well. But there are lots of queues that don't meet this property. A stack doesn't, unless you happen to put your things in in reverse order or whatever. So this tells you something about your priority queue. It says that no matter what it is, it is priority something or other. It has ordering. Then there's the queue part. Um, a queue, uh, one of the properties of a queue is that everything you put into it is returned exactly once. If you put three things in, you'll get those same three things out. Um, in our case, you won't necessarily get them out in the same order, but it, you're not going to get four things out or two or duplicates or different things from what you put in. So the test for that is pretty straightforward. You put everything into the queue, you then take it all out again, and every time you take something out, you check that it was one of the things you put in and then throw that away, and then at the end you should have nothing left. Um, so those two properties together, that defines a priority queue. Um, or at least in this case, a priority queue where you put everything in first and then take it all out again, um, because more complex stuff won't fit on a slide. Um, but these are meaningful. It's much more meaningful than saying put B, C, and A into my queue and make sure that I get A, B, and C out. Um, these are, they're more general. So that's an example of sort of a hypothetical property-based test thing. The focus is on high-level requirements. You're not looking at specific input and output. You're saying, what is the meaning behind this code? What is it actually supposed to be doing? So your properties define behavior. Um, the behavior of the priority queue is it gives you back exactly what you put into it, maybe in a different order, and it gives you stuff in priority order. Um, now you've got these properties which you've written, carefully handcrafted, and you need to test them. So property-based test systems will throw lots of randomly generated input at your properties. So your priority queue, it'll give you 
lists of all sorts of exciting things. Um, it'll give you an empty list. It'll give you a list of maybe 10,000 items, all of which are the same. Uh, it'll give you lists of nuns and strings and integers or whatever. Um, so you get wide coverage of um, all sorts of input that you don't have to sit and think about um, yourself. Now, randomly generated input means there's a lot of noise. If your property fails when you get uh, a list with 10,000 items in it, is the failure because your input has 10,000 items, or is it because two of the items in that list have some special thing that makes your code fail? So once your um, property test thing finds a property that fails, it'll take the input and it'll simplify it in some way um, and check again, and then it'll give you something that's much smaller. So if, the, um, if your property is failing because two of your items in your big list are the same, then it'll shrink down that list to just those two items, which makes it much easier to de debug and figure out where the problem is. But it isn't a silver bullet. Um, nothing is. Read your Frederick Brooks. Um, there are a lot of things you can't test this way. It's not a complete replacement for all your example-based tests, but it is a much better way to test a large class of things. Um, some problems with it, uh, you like your tests to be non-deterministic, right? Fails three um, continuous integration run, runs, well, passes three continuous integration runs and then fails. Um, never fun. Uh, and also, if you're running your code with lots of randomly generated input, it'll be slow. Um, if you write good properties, it won't necessarily be very slow, but it'll probably be slower than 10 carefully handcrafted tests, each running one example. But it'll find more stuff, probably. Now, this is that hypothetical example I showed earlier, but actually implemented using Hypothesis. The only difference in this code is um, over here, I create a priority queue in each method instead of passing one in just because it's easier. And this thing at the top is um, a decorator that comes from Hypothesis that tells um, Hypothesis how to generate suitable input. In this case, what I'm asking for is a list of integers for the top one where we're um, Comparing order, we need at least one, otherwise that will fail. Um, for the bottom one, where we're just comparing the same, that you're getting the same um, things out that you put in, uh, there are no other restrictions. And this code runs and it passes, and it takes under a second to test with a thousand um, different possible queues. So, we've seen an example, but how does Hypothesis actually work, and how do you use it? So, at given is the decorator that um, turns a function into a property that is run as a test. So it turns a test into a property that runs a whole bunch of times with randomly generated input uh, that's generated by the strategies you give it, and I'll tell you more about strategies in a bit, and reports minimized failure examples at the end of the test run. So a very simple test here, the additive inverse, minus minus x is equal to x for all floating point values. Seems straightforward, right? Everyone knows their basic arithmetic, um, except not quite so much, because that is only true for numbers, and a valid floating point value is not a number. Um, now, who in this room would have tested something like that with not a number? or infinities, or something. So already, Hypothesis has found some assumptions that we often make that are not always valid. But not a number is not a useful thing to have in your code quite often. Um, usually, you don't care about the behavior of your code if it's faced with things that aren't numbers. So you can tell Hypothesis, assuming that my code doesn't include not a number, 
um, this property should be valid. So there's that assume function there, which throws a magic exception, which hypothesis catches, and what it does is it just ignores the, this input data. It says, um, I don't care about this value, please try again with something else. Um, it's actually a little bit more magic than that because if you've got a very clever strategy generating your data, it can have an effect on what uh, values are generated next. So if it sees you're um, assuming all sorts of things about whether your value is positive or not, it can generate more negative values and fewer positive ones or something. Um, another way you could do that is to use a different strategy which gave you floating point values and filtered out not the numbers or whatever. Maybe it gave you floating point values in a particular range. Um, now, default settings don't necessarily work for everyone. The default for hypothesis is to run each property 200 times with randomly generated input. Maybe you've got a slow property and you only want to run it, say, 20 or 30 times. Maybe you've got something where there's a, a very complicated set of input and you want to run it 1,000 times instead of 200. So you can use the settings object as a context manager. Here we're telling it run with a maximum of five examples and turn the verbosity up to verbose. And that's the output. With the verbose um, verbosity turned up, it'll print out for each test it runs what it's calling it with, and then it'll tell you if it fails or not. Um, you're unlikely to want to use the verbosity stuff unless you're debugging something weird, but it can be useful. It's certainly useful for showing off what the code's actually doing. Now, minimization I mentioned. Um, let's say we have a very complicated piece of code that um, somewhere in the middle assumes that the sum of a list of numbers is less than 42. Um, approximated here by an assertion that the sum of the list of numbers is less than 42. Now, there are lots of possible lists that have um, a sum greater than 42. But the simplest is a list containing the integer 42. Um, and in this case, Hypothesis found that. It doesn't always find the simplest. It sometimes gets stuck in a local minimum. So if it started off with a list that contained 100 one values, it might end up with um, a minimal, minimal example that was 42 ones. Um, but it's usually pretty good. And it also works for more complicated things. In this case, the assertion only runs for big lists, not small ones. So it, uh, it's a more complicated condition to achieve, but Hypothesis still finds a list of three numbers, one of which is 42, the others are zeros, and that'll immediately tell you where to look. It finds the boundary of passing and failing. Not perfect, you sometimes get non-minimal data, especially if you have very complicated sets of input and stuff, but certainly much better than just getting a random list of a thousand items. Now, how do you generate data to put in because presumably your code is more interesting than mine and you're not just op operating on list of numbers and floating point values. So you use a strategy, which is a set of rules that knows how to generate values because that's what you're using it for. It knows how to simplify values. So for example, an integer is simplified by moving it closer to zero. A list is simplified by throwing out some elements. A list of integers uses both things to simplify. So it'll try one and then the other and then swap back and forth until it finds your minimal thing. And it's composable. So you can use existing strategies as building blocks to come up with more interesting data. The built-in strategies are very clever so that yours don't have to be. Um, so you're, not, you're probably not going to be writing strategies from scratch. That's really hard. I've looked at the code. It terrifies me. But you can build your strategies on top of the built-in ones. Oh, also, I have never used this, but um, there are some built-in strategies that will generate um, 
random values for Django models in your database and stuff like that, which is useful if you're writing web apps, which I'm not, but um, I've heard good things about that uh, support. So some very simple strategies. There's one that just returns a single value that you give it. Not particularly useful on its own, but it's good if you're combining it with other stuff. So you can take two different strategies and say, give me a thing from this one or that one. Uh, something to watch out for for this is that it chooses the strategy with uniform probability before it chooses any value from the strategy. So here, half of the values you get will be a string and the other half will be none. Um, so you'll be generating lots of nuns this way. Um, but often if you want to generate, say, ints or floats, that doesn't matter because both of those are, in theory, at least infinite set. You can generate collections of things. So here is a tuple of a small integer and a Boolean. And you can modify the things that you're generating. So if you want to generate powers of two, you start with um, an integer and then you map that through a function which is two to the power of that integer you give it and you get powers of two. Um, a lot of this strategy generation is sort of functional style um, processing of values, uh, but it's really not hard to, um, to do once you've, uh, well, once you've looked into it and played around a bit. More complicated things, so I want to give my code some square text, a block of text with um, n lines and n columns. Um, this uses flat map, which is, what that does is um, you generate a, an example value and then flat map takes that and uses that to build another strategy which it then generates your actual value from. Um, you don't need to understand this, this is all documented in the hypothesis docs. Um, but you can, from these very simple building blocks, this is what a five line example and you can generate a square block of text of any size, guaranteed square. Um, and you can also generate recursive data. So if you want a nested dictionary full of dictionaries and in this case strings and none, um, you can generate that as well. So you have all this data that you're generating and you've got some complicated code. How do you come up with useful properties? What is a useful property? Firstly, it should be true for all input or almost all input. Like you don't care about not a number, but you do care about anything else. If it's only true for half the possible input, then you either have to exclude half the possible input or um, write two strategies or something like that. Um, but generally, the useful properties are true for everything. They are general properties of your code, hence the name. Secondly, and very importantly, it doesn't duplicate the code under test. So if you are testing integer addition and your property says uh, my output is equal to the sum of my inputs, that's not testing your code, it's testing your ability to write the same code twice. Um, which might be a useful thing to test, but it's probably not a useful thing to have your continuous integration system run all the time. Also, it describes the code under test in a meaningful way. So back to the priority queue example, the two properties we had there are returns everything I put into it and nothing else, and um, returns things in a particular order. And those both say something about the code. They Together they define what it is to be a priority queue. Also, mustn't be too expensive to check. If your property takes um, a second to run and you're running three and a half thousand examples, that's an hour. Um, so try to make things that are easy to check. So good properties are harder to write than good example-based tests but you need far fewer of them to get the same, well, to get much better coverage of your um, code and input space. Um, and they're a lot more useful. They're useful as 
well, they're more useful as documentation than example-based tests. If you're looking at a test uh, suite to figure out how to use something and the whole suite is full of, uh, I give this input, I get this output, that doesn't tell you very much. Um, so some ways to, some things that you might use as properties, item potents. If you have an operation where um, if you apply it to the output, it doesn't change, like rounding a number, that's an easy thing to test a property for. Once you've rounded a number, it is round. If you try and round it again, it's not going to change at all, unless you've got a broken implementation of round, in which case you found a bug, yay. Um, round trip, so if you're writing something that you're doing in two directions, say forward and reverse, like for example, um, a JSON serializer, you can call the thing and get some output and then do the reverse and get some output again and make sure that what you get out of the forward and reverse thing is the same as what you put in. JSON is slightly tricky because um, that's not always true. If you give it uh, a tuple instead of a list, what you'll get out at the other end is a list because it serializes tuples and lists to the same JSON values. But it's good for a lot of, um, there are a lot of examples where it's, this is a good thing to do. So invariance, you've got something that is true of both your input and your output. So shuffling a list of numbers. Shuffling shouldn't change anything in your list. It should change, just change the orders. So the, the same thing is true of your input and your output. Um, transformation is somewhat more complicated. Um, again, best described with an example. If, you, if your uh, code is transforming some text to uppercase, then text.upper plus some uppercase character is the equivalent of your input text plus the lowercase equivalent of that uppercase character, all uppercase. Um, so what that's saying is that uh, you're expecting this small piece of data to change, and you know how it's going to change, and that sh small piece of data should change in this way no matter what the rest of the, the system is. So this is probably less generally useful than some of the others, but uh, I've still used it successfully for some of my code. Um, verification is probably the closest to a normal uh, unit test thing. So there you're saying there is something that is always going to be true of my output. If you're writing some code that turns tabs into not tabs, then your output should never have tabs in it. Um, the checking that your priority queue gives you things in order is the same kind of verification. And then another one which is generally not uh, applicable but really useful when you can do it is a test oracle. You have this system which you know to be correct and you're implementing another one which you don't know to be correct. Um, maybe this is some old implementation that you're rewriting because um, you need a different architecture to implement new features or something. Maybe you've got a simple implementation which um, uses an in-memory data store and your real implementation um, is distributed over uh, Brin's cluster of a million machines and needs to handle network partitions and stuff. Um, the functionality is the same, but one of them is a lot more complicated than the other. Um, so you can test the simple one, make sure that's correct, and then use that to test your less simple one. Now, what about testing things that have state in them? So back to the priority queue, you'll notice that the test we had previously um, all they tested was you put a bunch of stuff in, you get a bunch of stuff out. They didn't test any interleaving of putting things in and taking things out. Here's our priority queue that we had um, previously. It's the same code. Here's a much better one, which is much bigger and more complicated and uses a binary heap to get um, order log n operations instead of 
order n. Um, much better, but also much more complicated. Um, and here, looking at the code, it's non-trivial. There's no obvious way to see, does this behave the same depending on the order of my operations? Um, fortunately, Hypothesis gives you tools to do that. Um, the, well, one possible way to do it, and I've done this in other systems, is your strategy generates a list of operations, like put one, get, put two, put seven, get, 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 oops, it's an empty queue, explode, um, and run that by hand. Um, Hypothesis has a state machine-based system that makes it easier to do that kind of thing. It handles a lot of the machinery for you. So what this does here is, in the initialization, we create an empty queue. And then there are two rules. The first rule takes some random integer. So at rule replaces at um, given. And performs this operation. So here we put the the item that we've generated both in our priority queue and in the list of items that we already have. And then the uh, check for get is more complicated because we've got to get the um, minimum item from the items that we have in our sort of model of the queue, um, remove it from that, and make sure that that is the same as the whatever we get from our actual now, I ran this on um, a, the second last version of my, uh, where is this? The second last version of that. Um, no? Okay, this, yeah. The second last version of that, which had a bug in it. Not a bug that I deliberately um, introduced. It's one that Hypothesis found for me, um, which is that, it was um, sorting my things in uh, maximum first instead of minimum first. So it had all the, the checks the wrong way around. And Hypothesis told me, this is the minimized um, disclaimer, not necessarily minimal. Um, it's really hard to minimize something like this, but it generally does pretty well. It's usually fairly close to minimal. Um, and the failing sequence of operations is I put in a zero, I put in a one, and I get something, and my assertion says that zero is not equal to one. So the thing that I expected from my um, model of the queue, which is zero, is not the same as what I got from the actual queue, which is a one, because it was doing it in the wrong order. And that shows me where, well, it's a, um, the fact that that is the minimal um, failure case tells me that it's probably something to do with ordering, but there is a very simple set of steps to reproduce that. Um, and that's the end of the slides. Um, there's a lot more stuff uh, in Hypothesis, but the docs are, are pretty good. And I've got a couple of things that I can show off live demos if people want, or you can ask me questions. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. Let's, let's see if there's any questions first. Um, um, so, yeah, that's a good mic. So, um, do you mind being the volunteer to, to turn off the mic? Just make sure it's on. So, uh, the red, with the red top. Just put it on. Um, just, is the mic on? Um, so, Jeremy, how? I don't think it's no? working. Is it, is it working? Yeah, we could just speak a little bit louder. Hello. So, um, how would you use something like Hypothesis to test a state machine? Because sorry, can you bring the mic a little closer to you? How would you use Hypothesis to test a state machine? Because that's the first question that popped in mind when you said stateful testing. Because in in the state machine, there is uh, transitions which are invalid. And so you would need to let it know that these are ones that you want to fail and these are ones that you want to succeed. So basically like this, um, the idea is that each of these rules is 
an operation. And um, uh, the way I write these things is you have, at the beginning, you've got a, a precondition. So before you can perform this operation, well, let's do it for get. Um, before you can perform this operation, firstly, your, um, your model and the code you're testing, the two things must be of the same size. Because if they're not, then there's something wrong with one of them or the way you've written your tests or something. Then we assume, using the assume function, that we don't have an empty queue. Because if we have an empty queue, then we throw an exception. You're trying to get something that isn't there. Um, depending on what you're wanting to do with this queue, maybe you block instead of throwing an exception or something. Um, then you perform whatever actions it is that are part of this test. So you do your, you feed your input to your state machine or something like that. And then you make some assertions about the, the post condition. So what you might have is a bunch of different rules with different sets of assumptions. And if you've got a state machine, you probably want to use um, something that isn't the rule-based state machine. Hypothesis has a lower level thing where you, instead of having rules that generate things based on the rule, you can generate values based on whatever you want. So you can have something that looks at your system, sees what state it's in, and generates values that are valid for that state. Um, this stuff is a bit harder to, to implement than um, simple properties for stateless code, but um, it's still better than an example-based test which hard codes a list of operations that you perform. Great. Um, any other questions? Um, someone over here? Or someone first? I'll come to you second. Yeah. Jeremy, what's the most complicated thing you've tested with this? Because I can see how it would work on you know data structures and stuff like that. But as you head up the stack, um, obviously it's it's not as easy to generate and it's not as easy to define the to define the properties of the the unit under test. So, um, firstly, disclaimer: I haven't been doing this stuff for very long. Hypothesis has only actually existed in a production ready state for about three or four months. Um, I have started writing tests for an SMPP implementation, which is a telco protocol, which is made out of equal parts asynchronous operations and spiders. And um, uh, I found more uh, problems with using hypothesis with twisted than I found problems in my code. But um, if you're coming to the sprints, you can help me fix Hypothesis Twisted support, and then you can use it for all of your code as well. Um, a slightly less, uh, well, complicated in a different direction. Um, yesterday, I found a, I think it's a bug in CFFI. Um, I was trying to come up with a bonus level to this presentation, which is how to use Hypothesis to test your C code except I couldn't because um, I found seg faults in CFFI. So, uh, warning, Hypothesis will probably find bugs that you didn't want to find. It'll find bugs in the libraries you use, your interpreter, your operating system, um, your cousin's cell phone app, whatever. Great, thank you. We have another question over here. Uh, Jeremy, uh, how does, uh, just can you just bring closer? Someone can whisper to me while we talk closer. Uh, how, how does uh, property-based testing relate to your other tests, your units and integration tests? And so this is another tool that you can use. Um, it's really good for a lot of things, not so great for others. Um, integration tests might be a problem, but um, one of the examples in the hypothesis docs is using it to generate a whole set of random requests to throw at your web server or someone's third party API to see how it behaves. Um, yeah. Sorry, Brent, uh, actually can I ask yeah. a question myself? Um, do you think one could use this for an extreme form of test-driven development where I define the invariance of a function that I want to have and then I run a genetic algorithm on the AST to generate code that will pass all my tests? I like your ideas and would like to subscribe to your newsletter. Um, <laughs> it can be done and uh, David McIver, who's the guy who 
Roth hypothesis um, has done stuff like that. Um, we were trying to debug a problem with PyPy, uh, some weird memory corruption thing. Um, and our failing case was the Python interpreter seg faulted. Um, so he built a, a shell script around it which used hypothesis to um, minimize a set of uh, file names, which in this case were hypothesis test modules, um, until it found sort of the minimal set of tests that reproduced the bug. Then he did a similar thing which um, threw out lines of code until he found the minimal set of things that was syntactically correct and sig faulted. <laughs> cool. So just one more there. You said that the default number of generated tests was 200. Uh, is that you know really comprehensive enough to cover the, well, obviously it depends on your function, but do you find it generally comprehensive enough? I asked because I played with quick test in Haskell, which is similar, but it uses orders of magnitude more inputs. So 200 is a fairly conservative um, thing. One of the reasons it works reasonably well is that um, the built-in strategies are very, very clever. So the random generation is biased towards certain things. Your integer um, strategy will almost certainly give you zero within your first few test runs, and it'll give you very big and very negative numbers as well. Your float one will throw in infinities and nands and zeros and things with um, on the boundaries of precisions and very large and stuff like that. Um, but um, another example that I threw out when I was mercilessly trimming my talk down from seven hours um, <laughs> was if you've got an edge case which is at, say, 1,337 instead of zero, then there's another decorator at example, which you can put next to at given and say, hypothesis, use this as well as all the randomly generated stuff. Um, or you can just turn up the number of random examples. Okay, um, great. Thank you. I think we're going to have to stop here to give Stefano some time to set up for the next session. If you have any more questions, just come and see Jeremy during the, the breaks, please. Thank you. Let's give another round of um, applause to Jeremy. Thank you.